Great, so we'll make a start now as we um, haven't got too much time and we want to, to go through a lot with you guys this morning. So I just want to take a quick moment to say thank you for joining us today for our webinar introducing Privilege Access Management. Today presenting, we have Nick Sue's Senior Consultant, Carrie, and Psychotics Chief Security Scientist, Joseph Carson. Carrie has extensive experience within the privilege access management space, having worked in the industry for over 25 years. And Joe is our resident PAM and cybersecurity expert who's spoken at conferences globally. So we're in very safe hands today. We will have uh, time for a short uh, question and answer session at the end. So if any questions come into mind during the webinar, please submit them in the question box on your screen, and then we'll go through them once the presentation has ended. So on that note, we hope you enjoy the webinar, and uh, Joe, I'll pass over to you. Absolutely, it's fantastic to be here. I'm really excited to you know, go through today's session, really kind of get you up to speed into some of the best practices. Uh, we'll also go into doing some life hacking as well, and also some demonstrations into privilege access security. So we've got a lot to cover today in the short amount of space. So hopefully we'll be able to get through it uh, seamlessly. So uh, and Claire, many thanks for the introduction and so really excited to share my experience and expertise along with Cody. So the first thing I think is really important for the audience is that you know, these threats are real. They are not you know, something that you know, is uh, just in the news and it's not companies uh, that are really large. It's companies of all sizes are becoming victims. And it's really, you know, what are the threats that keep security leaders like yourselves up at night? And this is really kind of where I look at. I, I tend to, you know, focus in in the uh, the different types of threats and understanding about what is the biggest impact to organizations, and then what best practices you can do in order to reduce those risks. For many organizations, you know, financial fraud, business email compromise is significant. A lot of organizations are sometimes losing millions in regards to you know uh, invoice fraud, um, account changes, uh, and so forth. And we also see you know, a big uptake in ransomware, especially ransomware as a service, uh, where I refer to it as the affiliate program, uh, where ransomware creators are really kind of providing ransomware cryptos to those who will actually abuse it and use it in return for uh, like a partner program in return for uh, royalties. And this is a big, massive challenge for organizations. And I think many organizations out there should really make sure you've got readiness and prepared and actually have the right security controls to deal with ransomware. There's, of course, there's all others out there, such as compliance uh, failures, data poisoning, insider threats and risks, and also many of these result in some type of service or application downtime, which in turn, you know, for many organizations has a massive revenue impact and also brand damage as well. So these are things, you know, it is real, it doesn't happen, it does happen. I see it all the time. So organizations must take this as a serious priority, and it means that you can no longer put it in, you know, it lower in the priority list or in the back, uh, back list. Um, you must do something immediately. And what are some of the common causes? Why do we see these types of incidents occur? And this is coming from the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. And it really comes down to poor access management. For many organizations, you know, choosing default credentials or default security settings. Ultimately, we also see misconfigured cloud storage, organizations choosing the default settings and default configurations, which typically means security is turned off. We also see a lot of users overprivileged, meaning that they're either a local administrator or even domain administrator accounts, and basically those are being targeted successfully by attackers. Sharing of credentials, and for many organizations, this is one that I think is, is, a, is a massive one, is passwords continuing to be the only security control. That means the attackers, once they guess, are brute force, or abuse, or gain access to a compromised account. It's only a matter of steps before they carry out malicious activity. And of course, third-party access and remote employees, which is quite significant in the past year, especially with a lot of employees working remotely, and also there's a massive uptake in shadow IT. So what things can we reduce, do to reduce these risks? What can you put in place? What things you can do immediately in order to actually become more resilient? So we're gonna go through, first of all, some of the, the PAM best practices from Cadi, and then towards the end, I will give some of my experience and do a live demonstration. So, um, you know, live demonstrations are always uh, interesting, you know, but uh, we hopefully everything goes well today. So Cadi, I'm gonna pass over to you in order to provide us an update into some of the PAM implementations and best practices. Okay, thanks, Joe. So my name is uh, Kari Vierima. I work for the cybersecurity company Nixu, which is based in Espoo, Finland. 
And just as a quick intro to our company, we are about uh, a little over 400 uh, security consultants at the moment and, and growing. And we offer pretty much sort of all levels of cybersecurity consultation from the sort of board, board level advisory consultation all the way down to penetration testing, uh, deep forensic investigation, um, incident management and everything in between including IGM PAM projects where we can do um, sol solution design and deployment um, and also support. But now we're going to focus on, on lessons learned and this is really based on um, the over 30 implementations that we've done with Secret Server, um, both on-premises and cloud solutions. And also we've done uh, combinations of IGA and PAM, meaning that we've deployed it to the customer environment at the same time and really sort of built very tight integration between the, those two systems so that IGA would be handling, for, for example, the um, user lifecycle and access right uh, management functions. I've divided these lessons learned in sort of three different parts following the sort of typical uh, PAM project uh, phases. So first we'll talk about preparation um, and then sort of uh, solution design and implementation and finally production you know what it means to to actually run the service so next slide please joe okay so first phase um the so, sort of pre-study preparation phase uh, this is really the key part um, um so first of all make sure that you've really defined and understood your your business requirements thoroughly. You need to understand why you're doing this. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? What kind of risks that you're, uh, are, are the ones that you've, you've identified and try to mitigate? Um, so define your clear goals, uh, define your roadmap. I'm, I'm gonna mention roadmap several times here, but it is really long-term, it, it's really a key point. Um, then study your privileged landscape. Um, make sure that you've identified um, all of your end users. You've identified the systems, the credentials, the, the applications that need to be protected. Um, uh, identify your stakeholders uh, and, and identify and plan your use cases. So what, what is it that you're trying to do? Um, and then about the stakeholders in particular, don't underestimate uh, the, the workload that is required from the stakeholders um, because they are the, really the experts, experts in their job. So if you think about the, the end users, get them involved um, er, as early as possible into the PAM project because you need their expertise, you need their time. They are the ones who can define their use cases, their processes and confirm that what you've then designed for the PAM solution um, are the right ones. Um, there's a risk that you won't be able to get the benefits that you want if you if you don't get them involved early enough. Okay, next one, Joe. Then we move on to solution um, uh, detailed design and implementation. So first of all, lifecycle uh, topics. So uh, define the PAM lifecycle for these multiple different areas. So first of all, end user lifecycle. Understand and define how do you get end users onboarded into the PAM solution itself. Are there any possible modifications that you may have to do along the way during the lifecycle? And then most importantly, of course, understand and define the lever process. How do you remove the access rights uh, from the end user once they are no longer needed. These are very much identity and access management processes. So that's why those two areas are very closely linked. Then also uh, define the, the, the actual privileged data lifecycle. How do you onboard applications and systems and credentials? Um, and what happens at the end of the lifecycle of those systems? How do you um, disable those uh, credentials from the PAM solution? And then the technology lifecycle itself. How do you handle the um, PAM solution itself, in, uh, for example, for upgrades or uh, increasing the scope or enabling additional features and so on? Uh, 
then it's really important to define um, all of the processes linked to, to the PAM service itself. Um, not just the, the sort of individual uh, end user use cases, but uh, the ones that I've always mentioned, uh, linking it to the to the IM solution. So, how do you link those processes together, and how how do you make sure that they are as smooth as possible? And then, of course, the business processes themselves. It's really important to embed those PAM processes um, into the processes that the end users themselves use, so that it's it is as transparent as possible. Then have a, uh, a proper and uh, most importantly, a realistic roadmap, a realistic um, project scope. Um, as we all probably know, sometimes you just um, try to do too much too quickly. So it's really important to, to make sure that you actually have a scope uh, that you can, you can meet in the deployment. And then, since we are talking about privileged accounts, of course, um, be extra careful about security. Um, do proper testing, um, follow the industry best practices, um, consider auditing the PAM um, solution before production use, meaning that, um, for example, um, follow the psychotic best practices and, and use the hardening guides available to check that um, it is as secure as possible. Next one, please. So these are the, the sort of don'ts uh, relating to implementation. Don't leave the implementation only to the low hanging fruit. Um, it is of course important to, to uh, get actual benefit from the PAM deployment as, as quickly as possible. So do the easy ones first or, or do the ones that you've um, identified as the most important ones, you know, the ones with the, the biggest risks or some kind of threats that you've you've already identified. Um, but don't leave it at that. Don't forget um, application integrations and these kinds of um, application to application uh, or, or system to system use cases, um, credentials used in scripts or services and things like that. Um, and really important, don't be in too much of a hurry to go into production. Make sure that you've implemented proper hardening and verify it. Um, test, test, test again. Test your processes, um, test your design, test your configuration, test the use cases so that the security design is as it should be so that when end users log in, they only see the current credentials that they are supposed to see so that your access model is right. And then don't forget that PAM is not just the technology. It is only the tool that really implements the, the policies and the processes that you're planning to implement. Next one. Uh, then we thought that we'd, we'd add at least um, an example of what kind of implementation timeline you should be expecting. Um, of course, this can vary uh, a lot from one extreme to another. So uh, for larger implementations, just a ballpark figure here, you can expect um, uh, six to 12 months starting from uh, a pre-study phase going into solution design and de deployment. Um, these are the kind of cases where you may have many different types of target devices and credential types, you know, Windows, Linux devices, network devices, um, application use cases, and so on. Uh, you may have a complex security model who needs access to what in the PAM solution you may have complex uh, business processes that you need to, to integrate with um, uh, and so on. So you can handle that in, in multiple different uh, ways. I mean, you can have like an initial PAM project which implements the solution itself and the sort of main use cases, the most important uh, credentials. Um, and then after that, you can either have additional projects or you can move into like sort of an uh, continuous IT service mode um, where you have an established process of 
um, onboarding additional applications and services. So that's kind of, that's kind of a typical PAM project that we we come across quite often. Another completely different kind of example is is one that we had about a year ago when we were contacted um, by a customer that they were actually in the middle of an ongoing breach. Um, they were a, a target of a, a ransomware attack, um, and they wanted to get their their um, most important privileged accounts secured really, really quickly. And uh, with the help of uh, Thycotic and using their uh, cloud-based uh, uh, secret server solution, we were able to do that in, in a matter of days. Um, Obviously, in this kind of case, you you just pretty much pretty much bypass all um, detailed design, design and and anything like that. You're going with the most basic solution and default settings as much as you can, while at at the same time, obviously, making sure that that you are actually securing these accounts. But that was a obviously from the customer point of view, that was a really bad case. Um, most of uh, their IT in infrastructure had to be actually rebuilt from from backups, but um, at least we were able to help help them with the, with the most important accounts. And then my final slide, please, Joe. So, what happens after you've deployed the PAM solution? What what should you be um, looking into then? Um, First, keep maintaining uh, the PAM solution. So pretty obvious stuff. Um, make sure that you implement any any uh, uh, solution upgrades. Um, if you are running an on-premises solution, make sure that the platform itself is um, kept up to date. Um, implement monitor and auditing. Uh, use the automatic alerts that are built in into the uh, secret server solution. Um, this is particularly important for administrative functions. Um, so that, uh, for example, what you can do is you can set alerts for um, either very specific administrative tasks that are uh, uh, done, any configuration changes, or just any any administrative tasks. So that anytime any admin does anything an alert is sent um, somewhere. And that somewhere has to be some other team that the PAM admins themselves, obviously. So this could be like, like, a, like a SOC team, like a central security team or, or something like that. So that if there's a change in the uh, configuration of the PAM solution, um, uh, a security team gets notified and then they can follow up and uh, check that whether this was an a scheduled authorized um, configuration change or is there some uh, emergency or is there some malicious activity uh, going on so really important to monitor and audit you know who watches the watchmen kind of a thing then make sure that all new credentials are enrolled into pam and that sort of goes with the same point, uh, next point there that you know keep PAM up to speed with the organization. Um, there is of course new solutions being uh, rolled out into the environment, new servers installed. Um, so uh, make sure that those that those are actually onboarded and enrolled in into PAM. So for example, in the case of um, the organization, maybe procuring an entire new IT solution, then what you need to do is to make sure that the PAM aspect of it is already included in the sort of procurement and um, design and, and deployment of that IT solution. Uh, so whatever kind of policy or runbook that they need to follow, um, PAM is already there. So in fact, they should be contacting you to make sure that their privileged accounts are included in PAM. You can, of course, also use the, the built-in discovery tools in Secret Server to, to check that um, have any new servers been uh, installed in your environment. So you will get a notification that um, here's a new server. And then depend, depending on the way that the access rights are set up, PAM can actually 
either automatically enroll that um, into itself, or at the very least, you get a notification so that you can act. Uh, and then don't forget that the landscape is constantly evolving. I mean, we've all seen this uh, in, in the both IAM and PAM area. There's been some pretty big changes over the last last years. A lot of development in the in the tools and products, uh, mergers and acquis acquisitions and so on. So uh, make sure that you you keep up to date on that. So maybe you notice that some other product that you happen to be using at the time has an interesting feature. So at, at the very least, you can then get in touch with your vendor and say that, hey, this looks really interesting. Have you got any any similar things on your roadmap? And speaking of the roadmap, we sort of come back to to beginning here. Don't forget for, forget about the roadmap. Um, at least have a sort of six month, twelve month, maybe even year and a half, two year roadmap, so that you know what your next steps are, whether that's onboarding uh, new solutions, sort of increasing the scope of the PAM coverage in your organization, or maybe introducing new features. It's a living document. It will evolve and change. So keep reviewing it and adjusting it um, as you need. Um, so uh, finally, just as a summary, sort of my top three areas um, uh, what, in what we've learned. I think number one, business case and the management and stakeholder commitment, incredibly important. Um, second, have a clear roadmap. Uh, realistic project scoping, and and third, careful design and testing to make sure that you are actually deploying the right thing and, and it'll it'll work as you've planned. So that's all I had, and with that, I think I'll uh, pass it back to um, Joe. Fantastic! That was excellent. Really uh, exciting. Um, so many thanks, Kerry, and I'm going to kind of next slide is really kind of to bring all of those things together uh, that Kerry mentioned. Uh, a few years ago, I created what's referred to as the PAM access management uh, lifecycle in the system. So they really, really create a systematic approach to your PAM implementation. And you know what's really important here is to kind of make sure that this is a continuous program. Uh, getting into making sure you know some of the things that uh, Kerry mentioned is really that definition making sure you've got a good definition, understanding what privilege access is for your organization. Um, that continuous discovery, you know, it's an ongoing, new accounts will be created, new systems will be deployed, whether that being on-premise or in the cloud. Uh, you really need to have that continuous discovery. Um, I recommend that the discovery phase, they also implement what I refer to as the PAM risk assessment or risk register. So every new system or procurement will have the register itself into the privilege access lifecycle to make sure that you're applying not only it being put into privilege access security and management, but also make sure you also have visibility. You also make sure that you understand what types of security controls that needs to be implemented. And that moves into the next phase, which is about managing and protecting those accounts, making sure you've got a systematic, make consistent. And also, in many cases, what you're really doing here is moving passwords into the background. Um, rather than leaving it for your employees to manage and decide what credentials or what passwords should be uh, strong, let the system do that for you. Let's move passwords into the background so employees don't have to remember, change, rotate, um, you know, update them, choose them. Um, move as much into a systematic approach um, so that you can make sure that you, know, you do the best practices and actually get the most strongest credentials where possible. And it's continuous monitoring the usage as well. It's really important to have that visibility and trying to identify also a potential abuse of privilege access, whether it being from an external uh, attacker or even an insider. You want to make sure that those credentials are not being abused. One of my methodologies that I've got is making sure that we, we force the attacker to create more noise or to take more risks. Um, you know, having a privilege access solution in place forces them to take more risks because they will have to continually try to brute force or crack passwords or they will have to keep repeating their uh, techniques almost on a daily basis. And that means that they take more risks. And the more risks means more visibility, more noise, and it allows you to potentially, you know, detect the attacker before they carry out malicious, really damaging, um, you know, techniques such as even ransomware. Alerting on that abuse um, and sending it into the system owner um, and also integrate it into your incident response plan to make sure you've also got 
this as part of your remediation or resiliency process. Some of the things that um, Kali had mentioned earlier, but the one that they talked about, the ransomware case, this is really integrating it into that process. So to make sure that you can eradicate the access from attackers, you can provision new accounts that the incident responders can use. So you're also keeping an audit trail and not contaminating the evidence gathering process. And this is not a checkbox approach. This is a, a continuous process, as, as Kari mentioned. It's not just about a technology implementation. This is about making sure you integrate it into your processes and also make sure that your employees are trained and aware and follow the best practices. Um, this is actually you know, one of the few security solutions out there that really empower employees. It really, you know, it's, it's a solution that they enjoy using because as I mentioned, it moves those passwords into the background. And to help you get there, I've created the PAM checklist or matrix. This is about helping you ask the right questions. So in that early preparation phase that Kari mentioned, this is really about what are you trying to achieve? What's the goals? Are you trying to, let's say, protect against something like ransomware? And if you're trying to protect against ransomware, what are the accounts that are most exposed? Maybe it's your domain accounts that you're trying to protect. Um, how are they being used? It's being used to make configuration changes. And the teams that's using those domain accounts is IT admins and security teams. And that might be controlled today with simple passwords. So this really allows you to choose and have that navigation into how do you want, what additional security controls do you want to have in there? Do you want those passwords to rotate? Do you want to add multi-factor authentication? Do you want to have it as access workflows? Do you want to make sure that actually only allowing launching um, and after every time that session's finished that the passwords are rotated, forcing the attackers to take that more, take that risk every single day, meaning that they potentially expose themselves more. So this PAM checklist is really to help you navigate that environment. Um, and we do have a, a, a assessment tool um, based on this checklist to really help you ask those right questions and really get into that preparation uh, for a you know, path to maturity and success. And I, I always look at this, what does it look like in a, uh, a physical world? I always like to try and make comparisons and try to see. And the best comparison I think of is that if you think about a polygraph test, when you're trying to tell if somebody's you know, telling the truth or not, um, privilege access is like a continuous digital polygraph test, specifically for access, for authorization, for authentication, uh, for auditability. And it really allows you to make sure that every request is coming in for access to privilege accounts, that you can actually make sure that the right, let's say, polygraph test uh, questions are asked of those uh, requests. So you can actually make sure you can actually only allow the you know, authorized and the, and the authentic uh, requests and prevent the unauthorized requests. So this is really where it's like a continuous polygraph test for access. Uh, and privilege access really enables that for your organization. So let's move into a bit of a demo. I've got two kind of folds of a demo here today. Um, I'll switch into my uh, demonstration machine here. Oops, let me just log into this. So I'll explain uh, what you're gonna see. So the first thing is I've got a couple of different environments. Let me just change the display here. So it's not so large. So basically I've got an attacker machine. So first of all, I'm gonna show you what it's like from an attacker perspective and the processes and techniques that they use. And then I'm gonna switch over to uh, when actually privilege access is implemented and some of the additional security controls to really you know, make it difficult for the attacker to be successful, showing both secret server and privilege manager together. So the first machine I've got here is basically I've done an Nmap scan of a particular machine. And you can see that this particular machine is vulnerable um, to uh, MS-17, uh, which is eternal blue. Um, so this machine is vulnerable. And this is the point here is it only takes one machine in the network to be vulnerable. That allows the attacker to use that as a staging machine in order to basically carry out further reconnaissance, enumeration, and gain further access. So I'm gonna target this machine. And you can see up here, I've got the, tar the uh, attacker machine. I've got a Windows 7 unpatched machine. I've got a fully patched Windows 10 machine. And then I've got a domain controller. And I'm just gonna basically move from each one of those right through to getting full domain credentials in this environment. So we'll launch up my uh, trusty Metasploit. I'm gonna search for the eternal blue exploit. And here you can see I'm gonna use number three, which is the MS17 underscore 10. Um, so we'll use that. I'm gonna set my options. So I'm gonna set the R host uh, to my target machine which is 128, and then I'm gonna set my L host, which is my attacker machine, to my Ethernet 1 port. And simply, basically, find, finding a unpatched machine in the environment is as simple as running an exploit and gaining access to that machine. Now, when I gain access, I've only got a session access. I don't necessarily have, for example, credentials 
I've only basically opened up a session. But if I get UID, you can already see that I've got full access to this machine. What I could do is add a user, um, but adding a user sometimes is creating a bit of noise. So you prefer to try and be as stealthy as possible. So in most cases, the attackers will typically do a hash dump and simply taking this hash uh, from the system, I can then move it to my cracking machine um, and then try to crack that password. So I'm trying to create as little noise in the environment as possible. Um, so I'm not kind of uh, you know, notifying or allowing the attacker uh, that the defender's too much visibility. So I've moved that hash over to this patchy text. And then basically I run it against a word list. I'm doing mode uh, 1000, which is basically uh, a Windows uh, NTLM hash. And simply by running, I've already run this before. And it's basically taking this hash and finding the clear text password. So now I've been able to access, and now I know the account in this machine, so I can now access a bit more stealthy than I would have um, if I was creating, a, let's say, a new account. Another common attack is also using Responder. So here, basically, I launch Responder um, on the machine. So if you have access to that vulnerable machine, you put Responder on and you basically let it run for a day or two. And simply what it's going to do is listen for network uh, and NetBIOS requests. So simply, basically, it's running here in the background. You just let it run throughout the day. And if I go to my Windows 7 machine, and simply, you know, any request that happens on the network, any things that does a NetBIOS request, so I simply do, you know, backslash, backslash, sure. By doing that and making that request, simply this machine is now going to, you know, make a request out, and my responder is going to respond to all of those requests, pretending that I have the network share on my machine, which I don't. But in that response, what it's going to then do is share the Antail and V2 hash uh, with this machine. So again, I know I have the hash from that Windows 7 machine. Again, I can take it offline and then attempt to crack that uh, password, um, uh, that uh, hash into clear text password. So these are some of the common methods. Another area, of course, with remote workers is basically trying to brute force uh, credentials. So you might have enabled remote access or RDP to the public internet so that employees working remotely can access certain internal applications and systems or data. And simply here using tools like Crowbar, where I've got Crowbar, I'm doing basically a brute force against RDP. I'm targeting this particular machine. I already done enumeration, so I know the user of this machine. And then I'm passing a, a password, uh, a word list, and I'm gonna use the number of threads is one. And simply by running this against that uh, victim machine, um, it's only a matter of time before you do guess weak credentials. So this is really how important it is for organizations to make sure that weak passwords and credentials or default credentials are not the most common you know, in the organization. So getting those credentials, it allows me to move over to now to the Windows 10 machine because I've now have the credentials of that. I've been able to um, brute force. I can log in directly. Now, one of the most common things as well, just to kind of, uh, is that what I'll end up doing is downloading some additional tools. But before I do that, what I tend to do is go and make sure that I disable the security. So one thing we've been able to find here is that this user is actually a local administrator on the system. And what I can end up doing is going and downloading additional tools, such as if I load into my auto tools, what I end up doing is, for example, disabling security. So this will disable all security. Because I'm a local administrator, I've got the right and ability to do that. I might also launch a find password um, utility, which will basically go and check for all clear text passwords in registry and the file system. I will make, you know, run an open RDP, which will open up remote access so I can come directly back. I will also create a backdoor using sticky keys, which will allow me to come back in and actually from the login prompt directly gain access to the system itself. So if I move back in, I can also run WinPs, which will allow me to then go and look for additional vulnerabilities on this particular machine. And then um, after doing that, what I'll do is run Mimikatz. I will actually enable the registry for the clear text password to be in the registry. I will dump the credentials, and then I can log in and take a look and see what credentials have been actually used to access this machine. And ultimately, we scroll down, we'll see that the domain administrator has at some point logged in this machine, and that password has not been changed for some time. So I can then basically go and do an RDP session. Now I have the clear text password for the domain admin and log into the domain administrator. And now I can actually have full domain admin access. At this point in time, this is where they'll start looking for the vital assets in the organization, and then basically go back to their uh, attacker machine. And here, if I go into my auto tools, this is where I would then go and launch the attack.
uh, or download ransomware and launch it. And this will simply basically then deploy ransomware to all the machines in the environment. Um, and because I've got a domain admin, that allows me to create the biggest impact where possible. So this is really the you know real world attacker techniques. So let me move into the, the other side where we actually have privileged access running. So we've got secret server here. Um, I'm going to log in, this logged me out because of the inactivity. So here basically is where we're logging into secret server. And this allows you now to systematically manage all the privilege accounts in the environment. And I've got rule and scope enabled here. So as I log in, it only allows me to see the accounts that I actually have access to and visibility. And I've created by region. I've also created by cloud. Uh, oops, if I log in, just one second. There is auto login and definitely as much security controls and hardening uh, that Kadi had mentioned, you want to also make sure you, you protect this as much as possible. So also we have things like PTO. I can put, let's say, my accounts in here when I go on PTO and anyone who basically has access to this, my peers, would then be able to go and actually access those accounts while they're in these buckets. Meaning that when I you know, return from vacation, I can actually disable their access so they have, don't have continuous access. I can also look at endpoints and take a look at some of the desktops here. You can see I've got two secrets. I've got a, a, a administrator for this protect machine. And then I've also got a standard account for the uh, protect machine. Simply, basically, I can go and check this account. I can take a look here. I can check out the credentials. I can change the security controls. I can do a remote RDP launch directly into the system. I can also run an audit and see basically what changes. I can see somebody launched the desktop. Uh, somebody took a look at the password. And this might be an indication, let's rotate this password because somebody has looked and viewed and has knowledge of it. So really giving you full visibility and understanding about all the activities and accountability of privilege access in the environment. You also have dependencies. So this is dependent something like, let's say a backup solution or exchange server that, or a database that might have the dependencies across the network. So this allows you to show those and discover them. We also have sharing capabilities, meaning I can delegate responsibility or accountability again to my peers when I go on vacation or for basically periods that they need to, maybe the support team need to access and troubleshoot a particular system. So give me real controls um, over these accounts. I can also go, when I click on this, it also can force me to do a checkout, meaning I have to uh, issue needs to be fixed um, and then basically provide commentary and send that request. I can also have approval workflows, meaning that these requests can go and require checkout or require my uh, manager or boss uh, to approve it or the system owner. And you can see that I get notifications that every time something, you know, uh, somebody's viewed the secret um, and somebody's uh, checked it out, somebody's done an RDP session. So you can actually have visibility and granular control into all the activities of these accounts. So really making sure that all the accounts, whether it being cloud accounts, SaaS-based accounts, remote access accounts, VPN, firewalls, all security and production environment can be put in here so you can put the right security controls, the right auditability, and also make sure you enhance the security so you can actually make sure you get back in control of your privilege accounts in the environment. And not only is it about the privilege access, it's also about application elevation as well. So for example, if I actually use this and I do an RDP launch into this uh, desktop here, so now you can see basically I would have done an RDP into this machine. And now I've got basically different tools in this environment. So for example, doing the same as before, let's say I've got WinPs and I want to execute that as an attacker. Even after, if I disable the security in the system and I execute this, basically Privilege Manager is going to detect it and prevent it from running. Even if I'm an administrator in the system or a standard user, it allows it to be basically prevented because this is not approved or actually comes back as a reputational feed uh, from the likes of virus tools saying, this is a bad replica uh, application reputation, let's prevent it from running. Um, even if I also try to run something like Mimikatz as well. Uh, so for example, here I've got Mimikatz and try to execute it. It's gonna detect and say, nope, this is not something that's allowed to run. But other tools that are quite common that are used in the environment, maybe something like PS exec, that might be something that you use for troubleshooting or use for remote management. Executing this, it allows you to put additional security controls in place. So I can say, this is a test, continue. And now this is gonna make a request up to the server and require additional approval before it's allowed to execute. So I can go to my basically uh, log into the actual approvals. I can see this request coming in. And of course, we also have a mobile app that allows you to manage this and approve it on a mobile. And this is something you might want to allow it to run. So therefore I can approve it. I can also automate this 
if it's integrated into, for example, a help desk solution. And then you can go back here, do a quick refresh, continue, and now it runs. And this is also the same with the Alexa Process Hacker. You know, these tools you know, can be used for troubleshooting as well. If I click execute that and run it, um, it will actually make the request up the server. I can make a refresh and see this pending request. And also allows you to go in and take a look at the executable, find out more details, and also check the reputation on the virus total page. And by clicking on that, it will take you to virus total. And you can see the reputation of those applications as well. Not only it allows you to actually get the visibility, but it also allows you to actually get understanding about what, how events are happening in your environment, what applications are being executed, what's being requested in elevation. So this is really allowing you to put back in control, privilege access security, get visibility, manage the elevation endpoints as well. Not only is it about actually managing the application elevation, um, in this case, I can refresh this, or I didn't approve it, but um, I can go basically, let's say, if I do elevate uh, into a administrator and I go into local users and groups, and let's say um, I make an unauthorized change um, and add myself into this particular group um, as a local administrator. So let's say I go and basically say, you know, in order so I don't have to go through this process. And, you know, again, I just want to create a little backdoor, add myself to this group, apply and OK. So the next time, basically, let's say the system will do a quick update. And this, of course, is all automated. I go back to my test admin and my change has been reverted. So even if I'm an administrator and making unauthorized changes um, in order to create you know, easy access for me in the future, uh, those changes will be prevented and controlled. So really allowing you to get back in control of your privilege access security. So basically to help you get there, we do have uh, a book that I authored. I've authored five books on this uh, topic. And this is the Privilege Access Cloud Security for Dummies. So really taking some of the things that myself and Kari has mentioned throughout this session, this really is a guide for your, to you for success. So this is a, the book that I definitely recommend you download, get access to, and it will actually also you know, prepare you even for migrating and transitioning to cloud and to make sure that you're actually doing privilege access, which is viable for on-premise and cloud and SaaS-based applications. So getting you back in control of privilege accounts. So hopefully this has been educational and we can move it up. And I think we have a minute or two for questions. So uh, do we have any questions, Claire, that myself and Kelly would be able to answer? Yes. Yeah, we do. So the, the first question here is, does the use of a PAM solution protect against past the hash attacks? That's actually, that's a fantastic question. And um, yes, it does. Um, there's different levels of protecting against past the hash, uh, but the one that I just uh, showed at the end, when you combine privilege access security with application elevation, um, that protects against past the hash. So for example, one of the things is that uh, when I log into a system with a, let's say a domain administrator account, and after logging out, one of the things you would definitely want to do is rotate that credential as quickly as possible. And that's one method. The next method as well is that I only allow a standard user to access that machine is dedicated for a standard user. So I log into that machine with a standard user. I do all my privilege elevation on demand with Privilege Manager. Um, and that means that even if the attacker was able to get the hash of that account, um, they wouldn't be able to use that hash to gain access to other systems. So great question. And yes, this does actually reduce the risk from past the hash uh, from attackers. Another question, where do you see the PAM space moving in the next um, six, six months to a year? That's a great question. I think that uh, where I do see PAM moving in the next six to 12 months is definitely a lot more in the cloud space uh, to really provide much more transparency and visibility over your cloud assets. Uh, we basically, you know, in the, on the on-premise side, you know, that's clear, we, you know, we've got pretty much a lot of the on-premise side of things. Uh, but we'll definitely see a much more uh, seamless and more visibility across a hybrid cloud and also a lot of uh, improvements around remote working as well. Um, so I definitely see those being areas of uh, further enhancements, improvements. Um, I also see in DevOps side of things where you'll start seeing a lot more automation and simplification in DevOps. Uh, so making sure as you know, developers are doing continuous development and integration, that you'll see a lot more uh, automation around uh, privilege access controls within the DevOps environment. Um, in addition to that, I do see basically a lot more consolidation um, in the identity space as well, um, where really identity is, identity is the new perimeter. 
and privilege access is the new security. And this is really it's that convergence of those together where identity is the perimeter itself and privilege access is really the segregation, let's say, or you've got authentication and privilege access is all about making sure you've got authorized authorization. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with that. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing whether there's going to be more sort of consolidation and and merging in 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 overall in the sort of IAM and PAM space. So that will be really interesting. Absolutely. And then a final question um, that we have is, generally speaking, what accounts would you recommend to start with and um, to start protecting? So that's a great question. I, I'll, I'll give my, my thoughts and then I can pass it to Cuddy. Um, the accounts that, you know, there's there's two areas that I recommend that you prioritize um, as starting points is, is one is third party access. Any third parties who have access to accounts that you've provisioned, contractors, you know, service providers, whatever it might be that's, you know, that is not direct and, and you're enabling accounts for them to do some type of remote administration. Um, those are accounts that I would typically prioritize as the highest. That allows you to make sure that those accounts have much more granular auditability and also security controls in place. Uh, supply chain is one of the biggest threats and, and where you're gonna make sure that your third party suppliers, you've got more security controls to you know have visibility and make sure that they're not being abused. That is a place where I would start uh, definitely is one of my top priorities. Uh, the second area is, of course, the domain administrator. Uh, I really want to get the domain admin under control as well um, and making sure uh, that one has got visibility and auditability. I would then move down the chain after that. You know, here I've got a list of you know these different types here. This is why I brought this slide back up. So, you know, third party contractors um, and then the domain admins would be the two. I'd also then move into things like root accounts and local administrator accounts as well. Uh, but that would be over a phased approach. Uh, Kari, do you have anything additional your thoughts around that? Um, I, I think I think you got them all that I I had in my my mind as well. I was going to mention domain admins and then built-in accounts. So so yeah. totally agree with that. Um, of course, this this really depends on the on the business case you've identified. If if you're going with a really really specific, for example, business oriented. Um, PAM solution, then obviously do that first and then think about how you're going to expand that. So, for example, we have deployed a solution to a customer which was very much sort of industrial OT oriented. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about uh, privileged accounts and uh, administrative accounts in the solutions that they were actually selling to the customer. Yeah. So it was a it was a very, very focused solution. Absolutely. It really comes it comes down to the business, you know, use case. Absolutely. Yeah. And the risk yeah. and the and the business risk as well. I will say that risk is what determines where you're trying to mitigate and that really determines you know what your risk your highest risk are determines your approach to securing privilege access any any further questions i think we're uh, i think any other i think other questions that you might have it might be worth you know contacting uh, nixo um rsls um and we can answer them one-on-one yeah. -on -one, yeah. um Definitely. or even get into you know doing more detailed demonstrations so for the honest i really hope that this has been educational um, many thanks for you know being on us for this time and, and really getting insights into how both Nixo and Psychotic uh, together can really help you get back in control of privilege access and help move passwords into the background. Let's get away you know of cyber fatigue. Let's empower employees and let's really get into much more automation, much more visibility. Um, so you know reach out and, and we're, we're here as your guide um, and you know ears uh, in order to help provide you know best practices and advice to get you to where you need to go. Um, so again, it's been a pleasure and uh, many thanks for everyone and uh, look forward to seeing you on future uh, demonstrations and webinars and talks, hopefully in person sometime in the future. So again, many thanks for everyone. Yes, thanks everyone for joining. As, as Joe mentioned, we'd love to, to carry on the discussion on a one-to-one -one basis. So please do reach out if you have um, any other questions. Thanks again for joining and, and we'll see you again.